I started last week on the Christian and their warfare. The Christian and their warfare. We're in a study on the Christian and as we began in Ephesians chapter 6 last week, verse 10 and 11, uh, God's Word challenged us to be awake, to be alert, and to be active in the battle. In verse 10, we learned about God's plan for His soldiers. God's plan is not afterthought, but it's a, a, a primary importance. He tells us, and brethren, so all the church is, to, is to called to arms. Every one of us has a call to arms in this spiritual warfare. Here's God's plan. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And in verse 11, we learned last week, uh, Paul elaborated further on what that meant and he gave a word about our power to stand. God gives us power to stand. And how, how do we stand? How can we uh, be uh, stand strong for Jesus? He tells us in verse 11 about our surrender for the battle. He says, put on the whole armor of God. You and I can't be running from God and be warring for God. We got to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You and I have to put on the armor of God. That word put on, uh, the, ar the whole armor of God, it speaks of once for all. It speaks of permanence. That means you and I are to be dressed for battle. We're to put on the armor night and day, leave it on night and day, week after week, month after month, year after year. You and I are to be walking in, worn in the armor of God. Paul also gives the results of putting on the armor of God. We have strength, verse 11, says that, we, that you may be able to stand. We have strength for the battle when we surrender to Jesus in the battle. We surrender, we, we're dressed in the armor of God. Uh, without the armor, you and I cannot stand against the enemy. We're not strong enough, we're not wise enough. We can't stand against the enemy without the armor of God. We need on the whole armor of God. Then in verse 11, Paul began to give us some insights about our enemy. He talked about the strategies of Satan. He said we, we were to stand, that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles means methods or schemes of the devil. It reminds us that Satan does not fight there. Uh, no holds barred. Uh, he, he does not fight there. He's a, he's a liar. He's a schemer. He's a deceiver. He's a murderer. So Paul identified identify the enemy, uh, the defense of the church, and the victory for the church. We're going to see that today in this passage. Christians must be aware of our enemy and how they work, but we also must be active against the enemy by the power of God in us. So I want to challenge every believer today. Put on the armor of God. Believe what God says about the war, about our enemy, but also about our victory. Amen. Uh, so are you aware this morning? Uh, are you aware of the real enemy. Do you recognize, do you even recognize that you're in a war? I pray that God would use me to help wake us up to that fact today. Are you standing for Jesus and are you dressed in the armor of God? Are you standing in the evil day? We're going to get some insights today in, about into the Christian and their warfare, our warfare. If you're a Christian today, you're in a warfare. So I'm going to ask you if you're physically able to stand with me all over the building as we honor the reading of God's holy and perfect word. Ephesians 6, verse 12 and 13. You follow along now, for this is the word of our great God. The Bible says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. You may be seated. I just said stand, but be seated. But we're going to stand, amen. We're going to stand for the Lord. I don't want you to have to stand through the whole sermon. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, give us power to stand. Lord, give us perception about the battle that's around us, that's going on against us and against your church and in this world, against people's lives, against neighborhoods and countries, Lord, against those in the world. Lord, I pray you'd awaken us to the battle, this spiritual warfare that we're in. And God, that we be serious about our walk with Jesus, serious about this war for Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you'd strengthen your church today. And God, that we would be strengthened in the Lord. And God, that we'd be used by the Lord in this battle. That we might rescue those who are perishing. Lord, that we might be used uh, by you to make uh, disciples, to pass on the faith to others as well. And God, we ask you to bless our time as we study your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, notice in verse 12 and 13, if you've got an outline with me, you want to follow along with me. First, number one, I want you to see our number three in your outline. Notice the protection against Satan. Paul, in verses 12 and 13, uh, outlines the, our protection against Satan. 
And he does that, first of all, he gives a revelation of the enemy. He does that, first of all, by reminding us who the enemy is not, and then he's going to tell us who the enemy is. But first of all, notice the revelation, revelation of the enemy. He said, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, many people in the church are passive. Uh, they're passive. They don't, like, they don't like this idea of warfare. Um, and I'm here to tell you today, you're in it whether you like it or not. Some people take this idea, we don't wrestle. <laughs> they take the first part of that verse and leave the rest of it alone, for we do not wrestle. Let John MacArthur said, it is easy for believers, especially in the Western world, that's where we are, where the church is generally prosperous and respected to be complacent and become oblivious to the seriousness of the battle around them. They rejoice in victories that involve no battles and in a kind of peace that is merely the absence of conflict. Theirs is the victory and peace of the draft dodger or defector who refuses to fight. They are not interested in armor because they are not engaged in the war. He says, God gives no deferments or exemptions. His people are at war and will continue to be at war until he returns and takes charge of the earth. If you're a born-again Christian today, you do not have the luxury of not wrestling. You and I have been called to the battle. The Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're called to wage war against the enemy of our Lord and of his church and of our lives. The word wrestle, by the way, in the Greek, it, it refers to close hand-to-hand -hand combat. Warfare at close range. That's, that's, that's the type of warfare he's describing here. It's personal. It's powerful. We're called to wrestle against the enemy. In, in the Greek wrestling games, they, they, they became so serious that, that there was a fight, it was a fight to the death. Those who had, had, were pinned and beaten were, had their eyes gouged out, and they were put to death. I mean, so they, they were in an all-out assault, all-out war. They gave everything they had to come out victorious. Paul tells us in verse uh, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So he's going to tell us who our enemy is not against. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. What does that mean, preacher? That means that your struggle, that your warfare is not against your parents, teenagers. <laughs> hey, pa parents, it's not against your children. Our warfare is not against our spouses. Our warfare is not against our neighbors and our co-workers and our in-laws or our outlaws. Some of y'all get that later on. <laughs> our battle is not against them. We're not waging war against flesh and blood. We, we fight a spiritual battle. But some people may ask, who is the enemy? I mean, the non-believer is not our enemy. Even though occasionally we might run into, and it's more prominent in our society today, we run into people that's full of evil and rebellion against God, and they actually declare themselves as the enemies of, of Christianity. They're still not our enemy. They're still not our enemy. The secular media and the world systems work ruthlessly to undermine God's truth and God's word. But the secular media is not our enemy. Now, they're tools in the hands of the enemy. They're pawns in the hands of Satan, and Satan's moving them about and controlling them. They're being used by the devil. Our enemy is Satan and the spiritual forces of evil. Satan's a deceiver. He is an accuser. He is a destroyer. He's the adversary of our souls and of the souls of friends and loved ones and acquaintances and everybody in the world. So as Paul sounded this battle call, he wanted us to know whom we're fighting. First of all, he wanted us to know whom we're not fighting. Our enemy is powerful, but he's also a defeated enemy. He's a dangerous enemy, but he's a defeated foe, amen? And we need to rem remember that. So as you prepare to engage him in spiritual warfare, don't be intimidated by his influence, but put on the whole armor of God and let Jesus fit you let Jesus shine through you let Jesus use you so the problem's not found in the physical realm it's it is in the spiritual realm Satan and the demons may indeed use people but people are not our problems get that down John Phillips said our enemies are not people we must see beyond people Satan may use people to persecute us lie to us cheat us hurt us or even kill us but our en real enemy lurks in the shadows of the unseen world moving people as pawns on the chessboard of time as long as we see people as, a, as enemies and wrestle against them we will spend our strength in vain so we're wrestling 
If we're wrestling against the, war, uh, the flesh and we're wrestling in vain, we're wrestling against what God prescribes for us and what he tells us what's going on. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We must realize that we are fighting, but we're not fighting in the flesh. We're not fighting flesh and blood. It's a spiritual foe. It, they are fallen angels. Fallen angels. Charles Swindoll, I want you to listen to this. This is a good word he gave. He said this, Ever since the fall, we have been creatures pulled toward this physical world, focused on what we can see, feel, hear, taste, and smell. To do battle with Satan, we need to set aside our worldly wisdom and empirical approach to life. Instead of relying on that, we must open our eyes and ears of faith, trusting uh, that what God says about the spiritual realm is more real than the ever-changing realities of this present tangible world. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. No matter how dark it gets, no matter how evil people are, uh, people are controlled by the devil, yes. Today we're doing some counterintelligence in this warfare and God's try, uh, seeking to prepare our hearts and minds for the battle in the study of his word. Satan don't like us to be aware. Satan don't want us to be active in the battle. Satan wants to keep us defeated and deceived. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Uh, until we realize that, we will be frustrated, we will be infuriated, and we can be defeated in this battle. So, but we need to be awakened, and we need to be alert about the enemy. Stories told years ago of a mental hospital, uh, how they devised an unusual test to determine if their patients were ready to go back out into the world. They brought a candidate for release to a room where a water faucet had been running and the sink was overflowing with water. And they handed the patient a mop and a bucket and told them to mop up the water. If the patient had enough sense to first go and cut off the water that was overflowing in the sink before they started mopping, that patient was ready for, to be released into the world. But if, like so many cases, those patients began to mop while the water still began to pour, they kept that patient for more treatment. <laughs> Can I tell you today, God's done a work in our heart to get, clean out the evil in our lives. That's called conversion. We've been saved by the grace of God, and we, we, we are uh, filled with the Spirit of God. we got Holy Spirit living in us. He's holy, by the way, so he cleanses us from sin, and he, he does a work of grace and power in our hearts, and he, do, he changes our want-tos. He changes our actions. And so we see less evil pouring forth out of our hearts, but we also put on the armor of God. That means we take up our mop and bucket and begin to make a difference in the world uh, for the kingdom. Because listen, you and I have been called to this war, and none of us knows when this war is going to end. We're to fight until Jesus comes or till we are taken home to be with Jesus. Not all soldiers come home from battle, amen. And not all Christians are going to be here when Jesus returns. We're going, some of us, many of us, are going to be with him. But we're to fight until Jesus comes or until we go to him. One day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule the world with a rod of iron. And, and the warfare will be over then. There will be peace in the millennial reign as we reign with our Lord and, and, and Savior Jesus Christ. But until then, the enemy is real. He's attacking homes, families, marriages, children. So there's a revelation uh, of the enemy in verse 12. Secondly, I want to point out the ranks of the enemy. Notice four ranks. Paul categorizes these enemy, hit the enemy in four different categories. I want you to see these in verse, uh, verse 12. First of all, there's principalities. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. So he tells us to put on the whole armor of God in verse 11 because, that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Our enemy is the devil, but it's not all. Our enemy is the devil's minions, his soldiers, those fallen angels. Now I want to give you some a clue about our spiritual battle we're in. He said we wrestle against principalities. Satan has an organized army. Satan is not omnipresent. You and I are not omnipresent. Only God's omnipresent. God's everywhere at all time. I'm, you and I are here right now in, in the building, First Baptist Church. That means I'm not at home. I'm not at home. Some of you might be home mentally. Hey, I might not checked in yet. Y'all all right this morning? You're here physically, though. You're not omnipresent. Satan is not omnipresent. If Satan's doing battle here in Newberry, if, if the fallen angel Lucifer is right here, that means he can't be in Africa, he can't be in Japan, he can't be in Germany, he can't be in Hawaii, he can't be anywhere else because he's right here. He's not omnipresent, you understand. Satan is also not omnipotent. He don't have all power like our Lord has. Satan's no match. He's no counterpart to God. 
There's only one God. God has all power in heaven and on earth. Satan is not omnipotent, nor is Satan omniscient. He does not know everything. He does not know everything. He's limited. He is smart. He's an angel. He is powerful. Angels have power. He has legions of demons to carry out his plans and his purposes. So because the enemy is so complex uh, uh, to say that we are fighting the devil, yes, we fight him everywhere. Now, I can't say that I've ever experienced a one-on-one -on -one attack by the devil himself, Lucifer. I mean, why would he won't bother with me? He may attack Billy Graham. He attacked Apostle Paul. <laughs> he attacked Peter personally. I'm talking about one-on-one. -on -one. But when we are under attacks by Satan's minions and we are under their attacks constantly, we're being attacked by the devil. So, so when we went to war with some country, they were at war with Americans. Even though you didn't fight in the, the war with them, they were fighting our soldiers in the war. They were still fighting America. You got that? You understand that principle? We're, when we're fighting Satan, we're fighting his army. His army. So when I make reference to the devil, yes, we're under his attacks. Yes, he empowering them. Yes, he's inspiring them. We're also under attacks by his demons. Now, in our armed forces, uh, we have many generals and colonels and majors and lieutenants, captains and sergeants and corporals and privates in our armed forces. Each one has a responsibility they're given that must be carried out. Each one of those officers and soldiers has something they must do, people they must lead, commands they must obey, plans they must accomplish for the whole army to be successful. They're working together. Some of these have power over others while others do nothing but take orders. And our military, though, is highly organized and highly efficient. So it is with the devil and his army. Paul tells us that we are fighting against principalities. These principalities are like five-star generals in Satan's army. Now, they're the highest-ranking officials in Satan's army. That's what the word principality means. It's the Greek word arche. It means chief ruler or magistrate. They're his chief ruler, high-ranking officials in Satan's government. Uh, they are our opponent. He said, we're against them. They're against us. They are against you. They hate you. They hate me. The demons are help organize the battle plans and help implement the plans of Satan against the church and the truth. They're not, these principalities are not ignorant. They gather information. Now let me say in one sense, they are ignorant. They are ignorant because they are fallen angels. They, they were holy angels of God. They saw God. They worshiped God. They, they were created by God. And yet they thought they could overthrow God. So in that sense, they're ignorant. Amen. Just like Lucifer. He's ignorant. They rebel with Lucifer and they were cast out of heaven. Now they work diligently, tirelessly, persistently to destroy God's church and to defeat God's children and to damn God's creation to hell. These principalities are hard at work. Paul tells us we're fighting against principalities, five-star generals. Secondly, he tells us they're powers. He said we're fighting against powers. He knows how he describes the enemy, against the principalities, against powers. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The word power there is the word used to, for delegated authority uh, and the freedom and right to exert power. These evil spirits are referred to as power by Paul. Satan has his servants and they're not to be played with or toyed with. They're armed and they're dangerous and they want to kill, steal, and destroy. I mean, they infiltrate homes. They infiltrate marriages. They infiltrate lives and churches. They infiltrate businesses and friendships. They infiltrate countries and governments. They seek to do their commander's will by deceiving, by defiling, and by de dividing, and by destroying. That's what they're out doing. They use their power to deceive saints and sinners. Uh, they use their power to divide families and marriages and churches and friendships and nations. They use power to destroy your uh, people's health and their peace and their lives and their souls. They use their delegated authority and power to gather information for Satan. I told you Satan is not omniscient. He don't know everything. He needs help in his battle strategy. So he figures out. They, they listen. They come and they listen. Uh, they they uh, gather plans and they have uh, information about the Lord's work and they try to influence events. They implement Satan's strategies. They inflict woe and bondage on mankind. And they rejoice at the blindness of most of humans today. They're spiritually blind. And the hardness of people's hearts, not hearing the gospel and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're thrilled that people don't believe in their existence today. 
So we wrestle against these powers, these principalities. Paul also tells us we wrestle against present rulers. Look in verse 12. He calls them present rulers against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Of this age. Paul tells us we wrestle against the rulers of the darkness. Darkness, by the way, what an emblem of Satan and his demons. Uh, it's an emblem of ignorance and misery and sin. It's a description, uh, a no, a no more fitting description of those d demon spirits ruling over a dark world. You see, we live in a dark world that is oppressed by the devil, ruled by the devil. Much, is it, much of it is subjected to Satan. John said this in 1 John 5, 19. He said, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world lies under his sway. These present rulers are, are under Satan's sway and the world is under Satan's sway. Under his influence. It's present, by the way. So 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote, the battle was real, those demons were real. Matter of fact, you read the Gospels, Jesus was casting them out. They hadn't gone anywhere. He cast them out of people. They're still at work today. They are eternal beings. They're spirits, fallen angels. They're not going to die. And they've not been cast into the bottomless pit yet. They still are roaming the earth. They rule and it's an evil day. And there are present rulers. That word rulers is the word, Greek word cosmocrator. means a world ruler. Satan uses these demons uh, known as world rulers to cause havoc in this world. There's no peace in the world because of these rulers in the world. Satan uses these world rulers to keep people in their sins, to keep them bound up and shackled up so that they can die in their sins and go to hell. That's what Satan wants out of your life for you to spend eternity in hell. John Phillips said this, Satan keeps people in a state of spiritual, philosophical, religious, political, social, and personal blindness. He has invented every false religion and is behind every false philosophy and every false theory. And every false ideology and every false theory. So these world rulers have implemented philosophies, ideologies in this world that have resulted in the count loss of countless lives and the spread of incurable diseases and the oppression of God's church and God's truth in the world. Let me remind you a few of these before I move on. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to take that time to do that this morning. Uh, evolution is a doctrine of demons. Evolution is incompatible with Christianity. You cannot believe in evolution and believe the Bible. You cannot do it. They're incompatible. The Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void. God made heaven and earth. We didn't evolve. God created man in his image. He created Adam and Eve in, the, in his image. We've been created. We're not, been involved. We're not evolved. So if you pay attention to that doctrine, you're listening to a doctrine of demons. Evolution is not compatible with Christianity. Secondly, and here's another ideology and a philosophy that's very prominent in our, our world. Abortion. Abortion is murder. It's from the heart of Satan. Since 1973, America has killed 61 million babies. Over 61 million legalized murders with no one brought to trial, no one convicted, no one sentenced. Listen, but they have not stood before King Jesus yet. In Jeremiah 32, verse 34 and 35, the children of Israel had sold out, started worshiping pagan gods, and they began to serve false and dead gods, and the Bible tells us that they began to offer their sons and daughters into fires of Molech. They burned them alive. It was an abomination then, and it's an abomination now. Homosexuality. It is not an alternate lifestyle. It is an abomination to God. The LGBTQI, whatever else letters they're adding to that, that lifestyle is not acceptable. It's not popular today, but I'm here to tell you popular Christianity is unbiblical, but biblical Christianity is unpopular. It is sin and perversion of the, and promotion of AIDS and, and other deadly diseases. God made man and woman to be married and produce. Can I tell you, homosexuals do not produce. They recruit because they can't produce. 
in 2015, our godless, godless, you heard me say godless, our godless Supreme Court overruled the states and legalized gay marriage in America. And in the last five years, we've seen the continued downfall and fallout from the, this godless ruling. Today we have polygamy, uh, pedophilia. They're trying to legalize pedophilia and transgenderism. I mean, people don't even know what gender they are. Let me remind you, in the beginning, God created them male and female. There's male, there's female. You're either a male or you're a female. There's none, none no other. Amen. Your children, they're trying to indoctrinate your children, tell them, confuse your children about their gender. This, this, this stuff is being pushed and approved of and applauded by a godless world. Disney just came out, Ray Ham, uh, Ken Ham, excuse me, uh, uh, posted this way. Disney has a show out uh, targeting six-year-olds. It's got two lesbians in, in that show kissing. Uh, oh, it's acceptable. It's okay. That's what they're saying. It's not. It's a sin. So Satan is behind the scenes plotting and planning and pushing and scheming and orchestrating the demise of our society and the damnation of many souls. Here's another one. Communism. Communism has suppressed so many people, so many countries, a communistic country, North Korea, China, Russia, Cuba. Why do you think all those who are oppressed from those countries want to come to America? I don't see those people who have love our freedoms wanting to leave and go over to those countries. I mean, if they love socialism so much, go! We'll buy them a ticket, one-way ticket. I'll help them. I'll do my part. I'll put in somebody and go, if y'all want to go bad enough, just don't turn us into a communist country. We have today cultural Marxists in our midst. I mean, we got it, we're getting attacked from without. We're also getting attacked from within. These cultural Marxists, they want the demise of our democracy, our republic, and American freedoms and influence in the world. Then we got godless humanism being taught in our, our secular schools and colleges, uh, saying we're God, we're okay, man can do it. We, 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 we trust in science. We trust in ourselves. It promotes self-interest and godless activities. Then there's terrorism. We got, we got outside a terrorists that want to kill Americans and destroy America. But we also got a, those who are American citizens that are terrorists today. Who are burning and pillaging and beating and killing and destroying. They're not doing God's work, but they're doing the work of their father, the devil. Then we got false religions in the world. I mean, there's too many to name. I can't name them all right here in, in my lot of time. I got 15 more minutes to preach. I'm here to tell you, I can't name them all. But the men, so many people are bound up for the day of wrath and have gone to their graves thinking they're all right with God, but they were bound up in false religions. They were deceived by the devil and his demons. So we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against these present rulers. And by the way, let me say this. Don't ever think they're not present today. You watch your TV. You look at the evil going on in the world today. Uh, they're present today. Just as de Jesus faced those demons and cast them out, there was spiritual warfare then. It is just as true today. The demons hadn't gone anywhere. They're present rulers. Thirdly, fourthly, excuse me, they're a perverse host. He tells us in verse 12, they're a perverse host. He says, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. These perverse hosts, they're spiritual, that means they're supernatural. They're spirits, they're supernatural, and they're wicked. That, that word wicked, we get our English word pornography comes from that Greek word. It means depraved, malice, speaks of malice and, and iniquity. They're wicked and perverse demons. They bring to this world rebellion, sexual sins, and sexual perversion, and they promote every deviation of the truth today. These demons are wicked and they're evil. In his commentary, Sam Gordon said, We need to bear in mind that they have no moral principles, no code of honor, no higher feelings, no scruples, and no Geneva Convention to restrict or partially civilize the weapons of their warfare. I mean, they, they, don't, they don't play fair. They don't fight fair. And they'll take you from the front. They'll take you from the front. They'll take you from the back. They'll take you from the side. They'll take you when you, where you're the weakest. They will attack. They do not fight fair. They will attack you from the ones you love the most, your family. They will attack you from the ones you live with, your family, the closest ones to you. They will also use you to attack others if you're not careful. Be careful that you're not used by the devil. These, ho these spiritual hosts of wickedness are doing battle not only on the earth, but in high places, in heavenly places. 
That's what the word means there, above the sky. Uh, we, we, we're in the first heavens. You can see the sky. When you go outside, you're seeing the first heavens. Above that, there's a second heavens. Above that, that's the third heavens where God is. These enemies are in the second heavens. They, they control. They're able to go back and forth to, from earth. And they're doing battle in the heavenlies. So what in the world has that got to do with it, preacher? Well, in Daniel chapter 10, I'm going to give you a biblical illustration. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10 through 21. Daniel had sought the Lord, and he set his heart to find out God's will, and he began to pray. And on the day that Daniel prayed, his answer was given. God sent an angel to deliver the answer to Daniel. And on the way to deliver the answer to Daniel, that angel ran into the prince of Persia, which is a figure of a spiritual being, a fallen angel that resisted him. The Bible said he he resisted him 21 days. 21 days, three full weeks, they were at warfare. And God sent the chief angel, Michael, to do battle with that other prince of Persia, and he released that angel, and he was able to come and bring the answer to Daniel. Daniel 10, verse 10 through 21. You can go back and read that later on. I ain't got time to read it right now, but there's spiritual warfare going on in the heavenlies. So the preacher, I prayed, but I didn't get an answer. Oh, yeah, God sent the answer. There may be just some spiritual warfare. You just need to keep praying through. Don't give up. There are ranks of angels and there are ranks of demons. So we've talked about the revelation of the enemy. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We've talked about the ranks of the enemy. Those four ranks, you see them there. Then thirdly, I've got some good news. Number C in your outline, the resisting. The resisting of the enemy. We move now to our victory, the resisting. How can we have victory, preacher? Well, Paul's going to tell us in verse 13, it requires, number one, it requires being properly dressed. He's already mentioned this in verse 11. It's so important, he's going to mention it again in verse 13. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. It requires for us being armed and active in the battle is to be dressed for battle. Resisting the enemy requires being properly dressed. Are you dressed today? I'm thankful that y'all are dressed today physically, but that's not what I'm preaching about this morning. Now, if y'all come in here half-dressed, I'll have to preach about dressing right. Amen. I don't have to do that. But I am talking about being dressed spiritually. I'm talking about having on the whole armor of God. Listen to these two verses. These are great verses if you're taking notes with me. In James 4, verse 7, the Bible says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9 Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. That reminds us we're in a personal battle, spiritual battle, and, and you and I are not the only ones in it. So don't, don't get the Elijah syndrome, amen. Oh, Lord, it's just me alone. No, it ain't. You've got brothers and sisters that are going through this same attack, and we're to stand for them, stand with them, and pray for them, and walk by faith with them. We're to war with them, not war against them. They're not our enemies. They're our brotherhood. He said, take up the whole armor of God. And that's an active word, by the way. It stresses... Uh, Something on our part we do. Uh, the word means to take up in order to use. We're to take up the armor to use it, to make something your own. So the second time here in three verses, Paul tells us to take up the whole armor of God, put on the whole armor of God. When the soldiers go into physical, when our, our soldiers go into battle, they make sure they're dressed. They've got on their helmet, their, their, uh, their breastplates, their shield, so to speak. They got their guns. They got their ammo with them. They got their camo. They got their boots on. They're ready to go. No army would send their soldiers in harm's way, unprotected un and unready for, not ready for battle. Just like a football team, um, they do not send their players. Uh, they don't dress in ballerina, ballerina dresses to go play football. And number one, they wouldn't be allowed to play. And number two, they'd be laughed off the field. And if they did play, they'd get hurt. Amen. You see where I'm going with that? A fireman doesn't wear a t-shirt and blue jeans into a raging fire. They'll get burned up. They got to put on their gear to go and fight the fire. Amen, Brother Carl. Amen. 
And for the child of God, God's provided us the armor that we need from head to toe. And you are, you are now are to put on the whole armor of God. He said, therefore, see that in verse 12, excuse me, verse 13, therefore, or the King James used the word wherefore, means on account of or because of, because we're facing those, those principalities and powers and because we're facing those uh, present rulers, because we're facing those perverse hosts, we're to take up the whole armor of God. See, our enemy wants to divide and conquer. He wants to destroy and curse God's people. And you and I cannot be passive. We must be active in, our, in this battle. We're to be properly dressed and thoroughly dressed. We're not to leave off one piece of God's supply for us. And if we're not dressed, we're going to give Satan an avenue to get in and to hurt us and to bring us down. You ever heard that old saying, if you give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile? That's true, he will. Sam Cathy said it well. He said, we have a responsibility to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to take a bold stand against Satan and demons. Whatever part of your life Jesus is not Lord of, demons are going to get it. They're going to get it. The war's real. The demons are real. We must be properly dressed to resist them. Tony Evans gave, gave a good illustration in his commentary. Listen to this. He said, stay in the area where victory has been achieved under the cover of God's armor. He said, when you stand under an umbrella, it doesn't stop the rain, but it does stop you from getting wet. Amen. We may not change all the evil. Man, I wish we could. We can stop all the rioting. I wish people loved one another. I wish they'd come to Jesus and be saved. And I wish we had a whole world that was at peace. But that's not going to happen right now. It's not going to happen until Jesus returns and takes over. I'm here to tell you, we, we got to stand with our armor on, under the umbrella. We don't just stand in the driving rain, though. I've never seen somebody just stand out in the rain. They use an umbrella to keep them from getting wet, and they walk. They're going somewhere. Amen. So you and I, we got on the armor of God. We don't just stand our ground, but we're to be going somewhere. We're to be fighting the good fight of faith. We're to be taking ground for the kingdom of God. We're to be seeking to rescue those who are bound up in their sin, heading for hell. Verse 13, listen to it. We learn that resisting requires us being properly dressed. Then lastly, it results in us being, being provided deliverance. It results in being provided deliverance. Paul says, lastly, he said, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. So when we have on the armor of God, we have power to withstand and power to stand. Why? Let me ask you a few questions this morning. You can answer them, answer them in your own heart. Why is it that so many Christians are falling away from the church? Falling into sin? Falling out of fellowship? And falling into the clutches of Satan? Why is that? Are they properly dressed? Have they put on the whole armor of God. Are they even aware that there's a spiritual warfare going on? I love what Stephen Travis said in his commentary. I put this on the screen. He said, in the New Testament, it is not believers who tremble at the power of Satan, but demons who tremble at the power of God. You and I are not to walk around in fear uh, of, of the enemy. Yes, we, 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 take, we, we, we take it serious. Yes, we are conscious of them. Yes, they can do damage. But we're to put on the armor of God, and greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. That's what the Bible teaches. But when we're not properly dressed, we give the enemy opportunities to bring us down and defeat us. The Lord Jesus has all power uh, in heaven and on earth. He's already defeated and the, the enemy uh, at, at the cross, at the empty tomb, at the grave where he conquered the grave. And he has sent down his Holy Spirit to guide us and protect us and empower us in this battle. Not me, the dark foe, fears it all, but hid in thee I take the field. Now at my feet the mighty fall, for thou hast bid them yield. Reformer Martin Luther in his hymn uh, wrote this, The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. God can just speak a word when he pray. In and through and by Jesus do the people of God have the power to be victorious in this battle that we're in. And let the church say amen to that. When we surrender to Jesus, that does not mean that we're going to be on easy street. Matter of fact, we're going to be more aware and conscious of the battle. We're going to be a, a conscious who is not our enemies. Amen. Don't be lashing out against those in the flesh who are led by the devil. Pray for them. Pray for your enemies. What, what should we pray? That God would deliver them. That God would save them. 
that God would deliver their soul from hell. They're under the oppression and deception of the devil. Pray for your enemies. Even with the promise and the power to stand, our, resi our resisting is provided deliverance from us when we're dressed in the armor of God. We're able to resist in the evil day. And by the way, let me remind you, before I close, every day is an evil day as long as Satan and the demons roam the earth. Every day is an evil day. And you and I are to stand in the evil day. That word stand means to work out, effect, to produce, and then go to work. It means to make an end. We're to do all to stand. All, we, all to stand. Does that sound like what we're doing as a church? As a Christian. I'm talking about the Christian in their warfare. You need to get engaged today. Some of you need to surrender to Jesus for the battle. I, I waved the white flag last week. I, was, uh, I used that symbolically of what we are to be doing. Surrendering to the King of Kings. We're not to surrender to the enemy. We're not to give ground to the enemy. We're not to back up and run from the enemy. But we're to submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from us. Let's take a stand. God calls for Christian warriors today to engage in spiritual combat. Would you today surrender to Jesus? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus, your Lord and Savior. And God's awakened your heart to show on you you might be in a church building today, but you're still bound physically by Satan. You're still bound and shackled by your sins. You need to be, you need to be released today. You say, Preacher, I can't come to Jesus. I'm bound. Well, Jesus will come to you. He's already come for you 2,000 years ago, and he'll come to you today. Jesus Jesus is here today. He's drawing people to himself today. He's able to deliver those who will trust in him today. Be saved by the grace of God. Changed by the power of God. Come to Jesus today. Trust in him today. Place your faith in the Lord Jesus. Repent of your sins and you will be born again. You can go to heaven when you die and you can have heaven in you until you die. Let's pray together this morning. Listen, Satan don't mind us being religion, religious. He don't mind you having religion. Hear me today. Don't trust in your religion. Trust in Jesus. He's the one that delivers. Father, I want to thank you today for waking us up to the reality of the warfare that we're in. The spiritual battle and struggle that we're in, God. And God, we need the armor of God. You've told us what to do. You've given us the supply to be able to stand and withstand in the evil day. Lord, thank you for reminding us of that enemy that we're fighting. Lord, not flesh and blood, not against our spouses, not against our children, not against our parents, not against our neighbors, not against the, the, the liberals, not against the, the evil communists, not against anybody else. Lord, we're fighting against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We're fighting against perverse hosts, Lord. Lord, I pray for your people to be armed today. Lord, we do face a dangerous enemy. He wants our demise and our destruction. And God, we pray for your protection and your provision to be upon your people today. Lord, I pray for deliverance from some of your saints today, that they would be set free. Lord, they may have been in a place where they have compromised with the enemy. Today, I pray they would come back to Jesus. Lord, they'd wave the white flag of surrender today, and they'd surrender their hearts and souls to Jesus today to put on the armor of God to be dressed for battle. Then, Lord, I pray for those who are bound up by Satan, who have never been set free, never been unshackled, never been forgiven of their sins. Today, Lord, break through. Break those chains of sin. Lord, destroy the works of Satan in their life. Demolish the works of Satan, Lord, and do a work of power in this place and in people today. And draw people to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me all over the building?